Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today, my guest is William J. Radishell. He is the author of the new book, The Bleeding Edge, My Six Decades at the Forefront of the Tech Revolution, from Scott McNeely to Steve Jobs to Steve Case to Steve Ballmer and more titans of technology, William has seen it all. We are talking today about AI, about customer service and experience, and the role of Silicon Valley in creating more human customer experiences, and his predictions for the future of a world where many of our customer service jobs are handled by AI. Please enjoy William Radishell. Bill, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. Where are you based? In actually in Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C. But at the moment, I'm in California because I still do a lot in Silicon Valley and I have an apartment here and I come out every month to stay in touch and see what's going on. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Well, I understand that you have worked with some of the biggest tech companies and you were just in the heart of the tech boom, the Silicon Valley boom. Can you just talk about your career, some of the highlights for our audience that might not be familiar? Well, I mean, the I started at Data Resources in computing and technology and information in 1978 and have been working all the time since then. DRI was a real innovator and they really were the first company to try to sell information online. We were then acquired by McGraw-Hill. I went to McGraw-Hill. From McGraw-Hill, I went to Xerox, spent a lot of time inside of big companies. Then I went to Sun Microsystems when it was still a relatively small company. I joined on the day of the billion dollar party and I left at 14 billion. Uh, And I went to AOL uh, and then we acquired Time Warner and then that ended. And then I did some startups and boards and other things for the next 10 years. But I've watched, I mean, technology ends up being the layer between customers and businesses and increasingly between businesses and their employees. So technology is redefining the entire way the business system runs and has, and I've watched repeated changes. New technology comes in, it takes five to 10 years to get absorbed. And before it's fully absorbed, there's some new technology. I mean, people are focused right now on AI. And in the next five years, virtually every application and business will have to be rewritten to have AI as the user interface or the customer interface coming in. And that's going to be a huge disruption. Okay. So, I mean, you say now you're still in the heart of Silicon Valley. You're going there every month. My audience are customer experience professionals. They're thinking about customer service, customer satisfaction. They're thinking about how to create operational efficiencies inside the business to make customer programs run better and smoother. How do you see AI impacting the world of customer experience and customer service? I had uh, dinner a month ago with a CEO in uh, the DC area who had just run a test in which he trialed chat GPT versus his uh, remote answer center and chat GPT won and he closed his remote answer center and is now routing people to chat GPT because it was actually doing a better job of answering queries and understanding them than his remote uh, staff. So I don't think there's any doubt that, you know, when you call a company in the future, you are not going to be talking to a human being you're going to be talking to some variant of an LLM and it's going to be conducting the conversation with you. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's a good thing? Well, his data showed that it was, that his Mm -hmm. customers were the ones who are doing the rating and the customers preferred the uh, LLM moderated interaction to the one they were getting with the workers in in the call center. I mean, the challenge is getting, you know, I'm sure that a highly trained, responsive, energized call center person is absolutely the best. Yes. But finding and hiring, recruiting and maintaining them and maintaining their enthusiasm is is very hard. I mean, we were lucky in the early days of AOL that we could do that. So AOL had all US-based people 
you know, one day a woman called up and complained that AOL had spilled coffee on her. Now that, as you could guess, Blake, that was kind of perplexing. And the call center agent was really very good. And she was able to figure out that what the person did every morning was sit down at, at her desk and press the button on the PC to bring out the coffee cup holder. Most people called it a CD-ROM drive, but uh, she thought of it as a coffee cup holder, just like her van. And she put her coffee cup on there and then the machine rebooted. And when it rebooted, it pulled in and it spilled the coffee. Uh, I don't think an LLM would get that. I, I, I just don't think it has anything in its experience to deal with that. But the, the woman was very good. She did. She figured it out and cleared it up and explained to the woman that no, it wasn't really a coffee cup holder and so on and so forth. So, but I mean, I mean, look, I think customer experience is going to get defined by LLMs. I mean, the, the cost pressures are enormous, but it's more than recruiting. I mean, it's not, you know, let's face it. Call center jobs are not the best jobs in the world, which is why they're increasingly located in countries where they are because then people really want them. But um, in the United States, I guess the best call centers are those that run from home where they put all the people remote and they can, you know, adapt to their lives while taking calls. But it's going to be a challenge, but LLMs are doing a good job. What about in industries with so much nuance, like accounting, like the person that does your taxes or your healthcare? I mean, would you really trust a bot to serve you and help you with things that are so personal, like your health and your finances? Well, health, there already are companies that are going to open up kiosks that are purely AI driven. Uh, you know, ChatGPT passed the medical boards. Um, you know, I mean, the studies show that on average, the advice from the LLMs is better than the advice given by the average primary care physician, just because there's so much new knowledge and so much out there that they do a pretty good job. So I think people already trust Google search more than they trust their doctor. They are, you know, the percentage of people who go online and search their symptoms and disease before they go see their doctor is enormous. It's 90%, something like that. So the doctors mm -hmm. hate it, but you know, so there. Accounting, the issue is context. And the same with tax is that it has to know, it needs context for health too, but not as much, but for accounting where details matter so much, figuring out how to communicate that information. But I think it will come. I, I think the, the big accounting firms are all gonna end up using LLMs in place of junior staff. Same with tax. I mean, it's applying a set of rules and LLM can apply a set of rules. Do you think that people, we just won't be working or what will be the role of the human if this future <laughs> that you predict comes true? If, if I knew that for sure, uh, I, I don't, I don't there's some things that humans do really, really well. And the one thing that humans do really well that AI can't do is build trust. That's true. And we know how to build trust between people, between organizations, between teams, and AI can't. And it, and it lies with impunity. We know that it lies with impunity. Sometimes they call it hallucinations because it's lying because it doesn't know what else to say. Other times it's lying because it wants to lie and get you to do something you don't want to do. So, you know, I, I think it's going to be a challenge. Look, I mean, I think you know, the job pyramid used to be fairly gentle slope with jobs at the bottom and jobs at the top. And increasingly, it's being pulled in from the middle. So there are fewer and fewer jobs in the middle and more jobs at the bottom and fewer but very high paying jobs at the top. And technology has been doing that since the 90s. And AI is no different than any other application of software. AI is just a big algorithm. I mean, it's no different than we've been seeing since, well, I mean, the first automation probably is like 1975. Mm -hmm. So for nearly 50 years, we've been seeing this trend go on and it, you know, yes, it'll take away jobs. It'll create some, 
but typically it creates fewer than it takes. Let's talk about your new book, The Bleeding Edge, your six decades at the forefront of the tech revolution. What are some of the main tenets of your new book? Well, the, the two things that I took away from my time. One is, is that the great wins were wins that were made on knowledge and not evidence. And if I look at the big companies I was in, they could only manage on evidence. They wanted it proven before they acted. Well, you can't do that. You know, when um, Xerox invented most of the stuff that ended up running our world today, back at the Palo Alto Research Center, um, they went in and they asked the engineers, management team did, how much does this cost per person? And the answer was $50,000. And Xerox built a business, which I later closed down, selling this at $50,000 a person. Steve Jobs was given access to it as part of a deal to buy Apple stock. And he looked at it and he instantly knew that this was the future of computing. And he went back to his engineers and said, how much of this can you give me for $2,000? The result was the Mac. And the result is history. Xerox went away and computing and Apple is the BMF they are today. And so, but he acted on knowledge and Steve was famous for that. He would look at something and say, okay, this is it. And then act immediately. Xerox would be six months from that point, maybe a year, because they'd want all sorts of evidence to go prove it. And you usually can't get the evidence early. You, you've got to know something about technology to be able to do that. So what would you say is the biggest difference between knowledge and evidence, Bill? Evidence means you can prove it to somebody who doesn't know anything about the field. Knowledge means you can prove it to somebody who's an expert in the field. Mm -hmm. And that is just a huge difference. And trying to explain technology to somebody who isn't the technologist is very hard. And they may not understand the implications of it, whereas... Uh, someone like Jobs or, or you know, uh, Steve Case at AOL, when he saw Windows 95 demonstrated in 1995, he said, everyone's going to want this at Christmas. And he didn't have, there was no document, there was no McKinsey study, there was no documents that came in. He said, everybody's going to want this at Christmas. And he went out and bought the capacity to serve that. And he bought it without any approval company would have gone bankrupt if he was wrong. But he said, no, nope, it's going to be that way. You see it in, you know, Tesla understood that electric cars were going to come and they went out and bought charging stations long before anybody else was off doing it. And he was acting on knowledge. Elon always acts on knowledge. I mean, he doesn't wait for a convoluted decision process. He goes, yeah, no, that's what we're going to go do. And he knows the right answer when he sees it. And that is, you know, that, that's very important. But it sounds like for knowledge, what you're saying, it's, it's almost intuition. It's gut instinct. I wouldn't even say the word knowledge totally accurately represents what you're saying because, you know, Elon Musk, he goes with his gut. I'm reading a book about him right now from Walter Isaacson. And it, yeah. just even when he saw the, the model of the cyber truck, I think his team surprised him. And he just looked at it and said, yep, that's exactly what I want. And, and that was it. it. There was no testing, no focus groups, nothing. We can argue. I mean, I think they're the same thing. He has the experience and the prior knowledge to look at something new and look at some new fact and say, yep, this changes everything. And then act accordingly. What Steve Case saw was Windows 95 is a lot easier there were going to be millions of computers sold for Christmas and everybody was going to want to do something with them. And that something was going to be to get online and the modems were there and everything was set up. And so it was willing to make that bet. And it was, that's why AOL won was because AOL owned the capacity on that Christmas and the competitors couldn't get inbound lines because they didn't exist. Have you seen the Beanie Baby movie about the rise of Beanie Babies? You know, I mean, uh, I have not seen the movie. One of my best friends was deeply involved in that promotion. Uh, so I know the history from when it was there. So I haven't seen the movie. Well, I'll have to see it. 
Beanie Baby exploded because of the advent, the invention of eBay and the proliferation of eBay. And what they realized was people were starting to collect Beanie Babies and sell them for many, many thousands, even hundreds of thousands right. of dollars. But Beanie Baby wouldn't have been what it was, the amazing craze and trend without eBay. So it's interesting right. now to think about the proliferation of AI technology in all the other industries that will be impacted um, even in the customer service space, perhaps here's a prediction from me, Bill, that with the cost reduction for the contact center, maybe companies will wake up and understand how important this trust is that you speak about and start investing more in the people side of serving customers because people do like people and, and research shows they don't want more technology. They want less. They want more human interaction. I mean, they certainly don't. Trust. I mean, I, I believe that technology today is a major source of consumer rage. I mean, oh, you yeah. call up and you call in and you want help and you get the bot that you're talking to and it's programmed to deal with things that are your fault and doesn't have anything at all to do with things that are their fault. And that's you so interesting the way you say that, but that's what they are because Honestly, 90 some odd percent of the calls that come in, in many cases are because of something the consumer's done wrong. That was, that was true at AOL, you know, 20 years ago, but uh, that's the way they're programmed. And when there is an actual problem, they have nothing in the world to be able to deal with that. They don't, they, you know, they just go, well, no, you're an idiot. You must've done something wrong. Find something else that you could have done wrong because we don't know how to deal with something where we're not work, we're not perfect. I, I think that, you know, I, I see the rage, I hear the rage, I, you know, when I'm out with other people and I listen to them, everybody has some story of trying to deal with the bot that answered their phone call when they wanted help and basically kept saying, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, in some polite way, way but wasn't there to try to understand your problem or help you. So, Bill, here's what I don't understand about your industry. I'll say your industry is the tech industry. Yeah. Why do so many tech companies make it so hard to reach a person? And many of them just don't even have a contact center. I'll give you an example, like Asana, Asana software. Very hard to find a person. I don't even know if they have a call center. Google, you know, unless you're a big customer of Google Sui or Google products or Google advertiser, you know, it's very hard to find a person. What do you think about that? Well... It's the answer at one level is simple. It's expensive. I mean, the cost of a customer service call is probably $80 all up, all in, maybe give or take uh, $10. I mean, it's very expensive. So people don't, they're, they're managers that are compensated on cutting costs. And so what the way you cut costs is you have computers answer the phone instead of human beings. So that's that. Again, I think a lot of times the people in tech, a standard battle between the marketing people and the engineers is the engineers think their product is perfect. And since their product is perfect, why do you have to offer support? And, you know, no product is perfect. I mean, every, you know, there, there are all these examples of, you know, well, this is the case we never thought would happen, but it did. And, oh, well, unfortunately, you know, someone died. Um, so, but I mean, I think it's the same question as to why is documentation so bad? Because the people who write the documentation understand it at a level the people reading the documentation don't. And so there used to be a phrase, clearly only if known. The documentation was perfectly correct if you already knew it. But if you didn't already know it, the documentation was obscure. And it's the same, I mean, it's just in the bread in the industry. What do you mean by documentation? I mean a manual. Oh, okay. A manual for the product. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I once had a, a business win because I did something my colleagues thought was stupid. I hired an English teacher to write a programming manual. Mm -hmm. And she had to ask tons of questions. But at the end, the manual was readable and the customers could read it and get help. And the prior manual had been written by the programmers. And only other programmers could understand it. It didn't do much help with the customers. So I think, I mean, look, I think there's arrogance. I mean, or, or everybody can understand this. Everybody I know understands it. Why can't, why can't you? I think that Blake is part of the, part of the challenge. I mean, the tech industry has its own population. 
uh, every industry does. And, uh, you know, you, you live, breathe in the jargon. But here's what I don't understand about the tech industry. It's here's people that are so interested in experience, like even Apple and Steve Jobs, like he wanted to create something beautiful and magical that everybody would love using. And he did. At the same time, many of these leaders seem to be not very interested in the human aspect of, to be honest, of society where, you know, these people that build technology products, they like, I don't understand why there isn't more excitement and interest in customer service. I mean, it's happening now, but it's taken like 30 years for the software industry to be excited and interested in solving customer service problems that we all know we're sensitive when your friend who made the baby boomer movie or promoted it, you know, when his iPhone breaks and has a customer service issue, like his voice matters. He's upset. I think it's the history of these companies. In the beginning, when you're building the product, it's all about engineering. And so the company, when it's a baby, is all about engineering. And it builds up a culture that is very engineering focused, that isn't very customer focused. And what it's worried about is is engineering, getting the product built. And then it's getting the new features out. And it becomes driven by this cycle of here are the product release dates, here's the features you got to get. And that tends to drive the dynamic in the company. And customers are an afterthought, a necessary afterthought, but they're an afterthought. And to the engineers, it's the software. I mean, I was just in a startup giving advice last week, and that's the battle going on. The engineers are going, the customers won't buy our product because the salespeople are bad. And the salespeople are saying, no, they don't like your product because it's incomplete. And the answer is the engineers want to fire the salespeople and find new ones. It's it's passing the blame. It's like hot potato with the blame. It's like a lack of ownership and uh, humility. And, and And that's why so much depends on the founder. The founder is the only one who can counteract that. And the founders have to be able, I mean, again, one theme that runs through the book is this tech didn't happen in a vacuum. It happened because of human beings. And you really have to look at the human beings that were involved and the deals that were struck and the way things were done in order to understand how how the industry evolved. And if it weren't for these individuals counteracting the engineering bias that's there, uh, you'd have a very different world. Yeah, I I agree with that, that the founders matter a great deal. Um, I mean, do you think the customer service, the tech space is an exciting space that more of Silicon Valley should be paying attention to? Well, yes, but Silicon Valley is really good at building the foundation technology, but the big app companies, there are a few that are here, but they're the ones that were based on databases, for example, Oracle, which is very close to the foundation platform of the business. So Silicon Valley is really good with talent that knows how to build platform technology but building customer specific technology that really understands customer needs, that's a much more dispersed industry. And you see that people located in other places where they have different attitudes and value system. Yeah, yeah, I would say that's true. What is one prediction that you could share with us from your book or outside of your book about the future of technology and how it's going to change society? The prediction is easy. It's going to, it's been transforming society for, 50 years and will for the next 50. I mean, I- I- increasingly, we everything we do is mediated by software. Every interaction we do. I mean, Mark Andreessen 10 years ago said, software is eating the world. He's right, it has. Uh, AI is going to eat the world, but AI is just software. And every interaction you have, I mean, if you go back to Star Trek, that's going to be the interaction computer what's this? And we're going to interact with computers that way. We're all going to have a butler living in um, the cloud somewhere. And I'm going to go and ask your butler uh, if I can move the time of the interview and your butler will check and give me an answer and it won't bother you. That prediction is in a report from Stanford, did a project led by Monica Lamb called POMI, Programmable Open Mobile Internet in the mid 2000s you know, almost 20 years ago. Uh, So we're going to have more technology, not less. And the question is, how do you get people to be more 
human sensitized as they go build it. And if that. we don't find a way to do that, then we may head toward a dystopian world. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Bill, let's get to know you a little bit better. Are you good to take some rapid fire questions? Sure. All right. Let's get started. Number one, what show are you currently streaming right now on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon? <laughs> it's that you get limit. Um, what I've been streaming lately and watching is Forensic Files. The 250 episodes of that, I find that interesting in the analysis. That's what I've been doing. So I started that in the pandemic. Yeah, and it stuck with you. What's the most important part of your morning routine? Regrettably, it's email. <laughs> I mean, catch up on what the world has done. I, I live off of email news. So the news I get in technology, medicine, and geopolitical is all from newsletters. So starting off with email isn't, it's, it's the equivalent of reading the morning new, newspaper. What's your favorite newsletter that you get? Uh, actually, it's OODA Loop, which is oh. from a small company called OODA, which uh, takes a national security perspective on, um, on events. But I find it useful to have people with a different viewing angle look at events. And so mm -hmm. that's the one I, I, I read carefully every day. Um, I, you know, I get the New York Times and the Post and the Journal. Uh, I get all of them. I mean, I've been a news junkie all my life. All right. Do you have a unique leadership hack that helped get you to where you are today? Yeah, it's, it's trust your people. I've never been a detail manager, but I mean, successful leaders, I believe, have to be on a spectrum. For the most of the time, they have to be leaders running, you know, letting their people run the loop. When you get to some really hard problems or are making the really important initial decisions, you have to understand the details. If you don't understand the details, don't get involved. You're going to make a mistake. And if you want to get involved, then learn the details. Uh, and so I became expert in lots of things over my career because the details mattered at the time we were making a big decision. Yeah, I call that only sweat the small stuff. Yeah. If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Right now, it would probably be Elon. I'd love to understand. I mean, I, I did business in South Africa for a long time, helping a company there. So I think I understand that personality, Afrikaans. And I'd love to just pick his brain on where he thinks the future is going. I found that people like Elon have an innate ability to see the world in 20 years. And mm -hmm. to them, it's natural, you know, uh, you know, it's like, you know, my godson's a professional golfer. And when I talk, you know, he sees where the putt is going in a way I don't. I mean, he just, he just doesn't. I think Elon sees the future in that way. And he's probably the one person out there who, who does and he knows where it's going. AI, transportation, space. I mean, all of these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And lastly, if you had to describe your outlook in one quick motto, what would it be? Be quick to act, slow to commit. Interesting. Love that. Okay. Bill, this has been really, really genuinely a fun interview. I hope you'll come back. Um, sure. Soon. Love it, Blake. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> All it. All right. Yes. And where can people pick up a copy of your new book, The Bleeding Edge? Uh, on Amazon on Tuesday. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. All of you have been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. Until next time. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on social media, including LinkedIn, Instagram, and X.